It is the Everest of whitewater rivers, a torrent raging off the Himalayas that plunges through the deepest gorge on Earth. The roar of the Yalong Tsangpo is so deafening that one writer called it the thunder of creation. I guess I was a little bit far right and lost my balance. As I went past the edge of the hole, hit the edge of the hole, and kind of got eddied out in the backwash. And when I rolled up, I was uh, heading straight back up, straight into a pretty ugly slot. Over the next five weeks, an international expedition will attempt to do what has never been done before. The first descent of the epic Sangpo Gorge, in a corner of Tibet so remote and impenetrable that the first Western explorers did not reach there until 1930. of adventure, there are few unconquered challenges left on the planet. Running the Sangpo Gorge is the most feared of them all. Kayaking the Sangpo Gorge has been their dream since they first came to the Himalayas as teenagers a decade ago. The Sangpo runs along the northern Himalayan slope in Tibet and drains the melting snows of its great mountains, including Everest. The gorge itself was the model for Shangri-La, the secret paradise in James Hilton's classic novel, Lost Horizon. They are seven of the world's top expedition kayakers, and they have come to Lhasa, Tibet, to begin an expedition that has been three years in the planning, and that many people have said is beyond our human ability to accomplish. Indeed, even by the 21st century, only a handful of explorers have made it through the gorge on foot, much less in a thin plastic kayak. We've uh, traveled halfway around the world to the capital of Tibet, Lhasa, and we're attempting to make the first descent on the Yarling Sangpo River. And this is our first commitment. We're at the Sangho Nunnery, and in my hands is a kata, and I'm going to take this kata and hand it to the head nun. And on our entire journey, they're going to pray for us, um, wishing a safe passage through one of the deepest river canyons in the world. It's, it's really quite significant that we come to receive the blessings for this expedition from these nuns in this nunnery, because the place we're going to, uh, known as Pemico, is this land that opens like a lotus. It's one of the sacred lands of, of uh, Tibetan Buddhism, the hidden land of Padmasambhava who brought uh, Tibetan Buddhism to Tibet. So in a sense, while these nuns are praying for us on a daily basis, we can take that kind of uh, prayer and translate it into our own journey and recall and, and, and really put us in a state and mind of reverence.
wondering what's going through all their minds and what, what's going through our minds and thinking if they realise where we're going, if they care. But uh, yeah, hopefully their daily prayers for the next, well, until we get back will help us through. So thank them very much. Tibet is a land in which spiritual passion can be extreme. Some might question whether the expedition's passion is extreme, attempting to run the gorge in midwinter in the Himalayas. But that is Scott Lindgren's provocative strategy, run the gorge when the water is at its lowest flow all year. How low, however, is the question that could end the expedition before it begins. We were driving up the valley. The river was completely frozen most of the way up. You know, it, it could be three feet of snow up here and there's just nothing. And everybody that we've been talking to just says it's an unusually dry year. What we've done here on this attempt at the Sangpa is we've decided to come here during the middle of winter in, a, in an attempt to uh, get the river as low as possible. So we're braving the cold rather than braving high water. Everything that we've seen thus far has pointed to the fact that the river is as low as it is going to get. There's no other river in the Himalayas that drops with such gradient and such power and such volume. The Arling Sing Po travels nearly 600 miles along the Himalayan mountain range before it decides to plunge off of the Tibetan plateau and slice through these two massive peaks. Namcha Barwa and Jala Peri lie at the eastern end of the Himalayas, 200 miles from Lhasa. The road to the Tsangpo Gorge ends at the village of Pei. It is the gateway to the gorge, where the gear is unloaded, the Tibetan porters are hired, where the outside Tsangpo Gorge expedition turns from a dream on the part of seven young kayakers into a full-fledged assault on the world's most dangerous river. They've brought over a ton and a half of food and gear, seven kayaks, 60 pounds of chocolate. New Zealander David Allardyce is known as the Gas Man, the expedition wizard with 20 years of experience in the Himalayas. We've got 60 porters at the moment, heading off for probably 45 to 50 days if all goes well. Every week we'll be dropping porters, you know, just to, we'll get to a certain stage, we'll eat food, drop them, make food caches, etc. Um, but all up, we're heading off into the uh, area between Namchibawa and uh, Jalapiri with 80 people. Uh, it's a moving circus, but it only gets better from here on out. You know, I had heard from a lot of the legends of kayaking that this was the most challenging and complex river expedition in the world. And Many generations of kayakers have had to pass this one by. And when you have to make class five plus moves above, uh, you know, class six rapids that can kill you, you know, that's where the reality sets in. So this is the first time that we've made it down to water level and really gotten to feel this thing down in the core of us. And if you look around, we can move around. Obviously, this is a huge rapid, but we got eddies. It's not an absurd flow. It's remarkable. The banks are wide open. The water's obviously low, and uh, I'm saying we've probably got just over 10,000 uh, CFS here, which is pretty much what we were hoping for, what we expected. So, job's on. We're into it tomorrow. CFS is cubic feet per second, how kayakers measure the river's flow. 10,000 CFS here before they've even reached the gorge is comparable to the Colorado River in the middle of the Grand Canyon. What's it like to finally be at the put-in, Alan? My heart's going off. I've got major butterflies. But, um, you know, it's just the river. <laughs> a little bit colder today than it was yesterday, so kind of too bad, but the river looks like it's a runnable flow. And come all the way around the world. That's 
7,500 miles, I think my GPS says from home. It's a pretty amazing feeling of apprehension in our camp this morning. Everyone's definitely feeling a bit nervous, but we're psyched just to hit the water and get going, get into a normal kind of river mode, start breaking it down. The, the team we've got is spot on, it's brilliant. Uh, we've been together for nearly a month now. It's about as strong a team as we could have, I think. In just the first rapid after pay, the river begins its 9,000 foot plunge to India. The river's steeper gradient adds exponentially to its force and power. The Sangpo is now 10 times the power of the Colorado River. My arms feel like lead. Just trying to, at one point, we had to scoot out towards the middle and then back to the left again. And just trying to turn the boat and pull it back in to the side was hard work. There's a 10 skiddy on the water this morning. It wasn't until I paddled a couple of miles of flat water, I started to kind of lose stuff a bit to start to think river. We've got Namchi Bawa right up in the barn over here, it's towering over us. Unfortunately, we can't see it today, but we're just right in there. We're right in the bottom of it, and we're going even deeper. Deeper and deeper into this thing. This river is um, basically the, the biggest river I've ever been on. Like I, I look at some of the rapids where it's split the channels, and one channel looks like the, the the biggest river of this gradient that I've ever been down. 14 miles into the gorge, the trail continues running alongside the river. Here, almost literally cut into its sheer cliffs. The deeper they travel into the gorge, the team discovers that some of their personal items, such as knives, watches, and food, are being stolen by the Tibetan porters. They are well aware of the porters' reputation in this region for thievery and betrayal, dating back almost a century. But for our Tibetan guide, Sharab, the Sangpo Gorge is a sacred place. This is his third pilgrimage and he hopes to complete his spiritual quest by reaching the sacred waterfalls at the heart of the gorge. Yesterday morning we had the uh, donkeys leave the, um, the trek and all the porters sorted out their gear and um, we headed up over the Musila Pass, which climbs about 3,000 feet um, straight up. The trail's up over the top and down the other side. Um, it was pretty interesting, it was a hard day for the porters. These are basically farmers and that, they're not professional porters, they're not used to carrying those loads, and they struggled. Um, combined with their own food for probably 40, 50 days, you're looking at about 70 or 80 pounds that they're carrying all up, uh, and it's, it's hard going. All the while we're like in the middle of this gorge and we've got peaks over 7,000 meters on both sides. And the trekking crew has just been up and down every day. They've had a pass to contend with every day. And it's been a mission just trying to move the land crew down the river and to get ourselves down the river as well and just try to keep it all together. It's, uh, it's been intense. Although it may not look like it, expedition kayaking is a team endeavor in which the boaters scout for each other and are in the water together for a possible rescue if necessary. But without warning, Steve Fisher launched out on his own in what became a harrowing brush with death. 
It was a defining moment in the expedition. They vowed that a solo move like that would not happen again. fourth day on the river and there was actually a glacial tongue that came right down to the, the water on the river left uh, from the Jalapuri Massif. It was really impressive just to be in the water and see the ice there. Mikey Abbott is the co-expedition leader with Scott Lindgren. His grandfather was a famous British tiger hunter in India. Although Mikey was raised in New Zealand, he has run more rivers in northern India than anyone before him. day six down in the St. Paul Gorge. Um, our first night's camp on the river, I noticed a small little bump on my neck. It's kind of weird, didn't know what it was. And now, about five days later, <laughs> everybody thinks I've got the chicken pox. <laughs> Can't think of a better place to have it. The only thing that really gets my mind off it is when I'm out in the big rapids, because then you don't have much time to think of anything about except for surviving. Hopefully this goes away soon and hopefully it actually is something that we know is not deadly or something. We don't, everybody thinks it's chicken pox, but how should we know? I don't know. But um, yeah, woohoo. <laughs> Dustin Knapp is a world-class cameraman in addition to being a world-class kayaker. At 25, he is also the youngest member of the expedition. His chicken pox will last a week. Now deep into the upper gorge, the river is now 20 times steeper and more powerful than the Colorado. The team has already passed through the rapid where American kayaker Doug Gordon drowned in 1998, bringing a tragic end to the last expedition that attempted to run the gorge. about a 700 foot climb from our camp along the river at the base of a extraordinary narrow walled gorge. We're about as deep into the Zangpo Gorge as you can possibly be here. We still have many days to toil just to get out. It's really quite remarkable that we're really, the kayaking group and the land party is really traveling in two different worlds. And you become evident of that every day, I think, as we join forces at the end of the day. We tell our tales of these bushwhacking through uh, thorns and up steep slopes and slips and falls and and just general fatigue from this this merciless landscape while the river runners are confronting a whole different environment down there of rock and water and and just that ever-present threat of the unknown that the river brings but in many respects we equally have a severe challenge ahead of us There is no trail. This this is an uninhabited region that these guys, the locals, don't go in here. They don't. They stay away from it. They, they either come in from the other side, or they don't even make the the pilgrimage to Pemico Chung anymore. So it's just completely overgrown, and uh, you're basically following game trails. Which I don't even know if the game used it too much. It's just so overgrown. It's it's really steep. It's loose, and when it rains a little bit, it's slick. The 
first explorer to trek through the gorge was Frank Kingdon Ward in 1924. He described the river as follows. The river continued to advance with fierce rapids which ate hungrily into the core of the mountain. The gorge was growing even narrower, the gradient steeper, until the power behind the maddened river was terrific. Alan Ellard is known throughout the adventure world as a premier expedition kayaker, a master of expedition online technology. He is filing a written and audio journal and sending photographs to Outside Online. Pretty large rapid, got a major constriction, and this really steep ramp. It looks like you'll wash through, but you'll take a bit of a beating on the way. The greatest unknown of an attempted first descent is just that the unknown. Much of the Tsangpo here at river level has never been seen by human eyes before. It has, however, been seen from space. These images can give them an idea of what may be around the next bend, and that may save their lives. Uh, even though there was like a fairly kind of feasible line there, I feel really good about uh, being just below the main drop. Um, I'm gonna launch myself off here and uh, hopefully Stay on top of the water, angling out towards the midstream and get out towards the middle of the river. The river's starting to pick up quite a bit of gradient. The rapid here looked like it had a line straight down the middle of it, but as you can see, it's a really, 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 really big rapid, and I'm glad I didn't decide to run it. This place is intense, like, Pretty much, you really feel like you're deep down in there. The, the river is huge, and the river is just consistently pushing downstream. There's, there's barely a, uh, a, a like if you swim in the rapids where w there's a pool below, what we consider to be a pool. If you're midstream, you'd be lucky to get to the side before the next rapid, even in the best of circumstances. Poked our way down into this gorge to this ferry move. This is probably the biggest crux we've come across. And uh, the, the height of the whole move was just this ferry move right across in front of this big rock right there. It's a good one. It keeps the juices flowing. We've just been able to porridge our way down, which hasn't been easy either. There's huge boulders in the riverbed and had to make some really imaginative ferries and portages and crosses and getting into caves and paddling out of caves and just really imaginative lines to, to pick our way down the riverbed. Shot or not, but I just got absolutely hammered. Went into a hole. I didn't think I was gonna come out. Long day. <laughs> February 16, 2002, the expedition completed the historic first whitewater descent of the Mammoth Upper Gorge of the Tsangpo, the team's first goal in its epic run of the Everest of Rivers. They carry one of the fabled Explorers Club expedition flags. So we've stopped now at Clear Creek, which is one of the small tributaries that comes in off the mountain range into the Yalong Tsangpo. We're going to be portaging around about the next eight miles or so of river. 
That's because of uh, an extremely tight canyon with uh, almost certainly no exit once you get in there. And not only would you not be able to exit, but we do know from previous explorers that uh, inside that gorge is 90% unrunnable white water. It's the steepest section of the river and uh, we're going to pick up on the river again once it exits that tight gorge, that eight mile section and uh, continue running some more good white water. If it's steep, then I know I'm going the right way. Ahead is the 12,000 foot Sanchen La Pass, over which they must carry their kayaks and gear to portage around the falls and the eight miles of river that cannot be run. Well, we've uh, just climbed about 1,500 feet off the river on our way up the Session La, and that means that we're um, just under halfway. No, this is actually the first time I've been mountaineering with my kayak. I think I know why. Seems like everybody's doing pretty well. I was expecting a lot more snow, but there's not much snow, which is good, and it's hard. We got out nice and early this morning. It makes a big difference. Still the longest portage I've ever done. We're not even halfway yet. Well, today's my birthday, and on this day, 20 years ago, I ran my first rapid in a kayak. So, having these views here is quite a way to celebrate. Well worth the effort. Amazing place. Happy birthday, Steve. Thanks, Ken. Many people believe Steve Fisher, 26, is the top big water kayaker in the world. Born in South Africa, he did most of his growing up on the formidable Zambezi River in Zimbabwe. That's the most <laughs> dangerous thing I've ever done. Is it? One <laughs> slip and yeah. you'll go Johnny right to where we started. Yeah. Yeah. Strapped no, to this thing and all. Pretty exciting stuff, pretty exciting portage, by far the most epic portage that, uh, that I think any of us has ever been done or potentially has ever been done with, uh, with a kayak. So today is the 18th day of our Yarling Sangpo adventure and the fourth day of one of the most brutal portages in kayaking history. Last night, or actually for the last two days, we've descended from the pass down into Luku, and we're just uh, three or four hours above our first village that we will have seen since Jala. And we're expecting five houses, fire water, hot springs, dancing ladies. <laughs> Well, we carried our kayaks over the mountain. Certainly one of the toughest things I've ever done. 
And uh, I must say that on that uh, final day, there was some serious consideration about throwing my kayak off the cliff. We've been on the on the river and in the in the on the trail for like 19 days, I think, and we've come up and over the mountain and down into civilization, and all hell has broken loose. <laughs> In the West, we would call it extortion, or worse. The Tibetan porters have turned on Scott and mutinied. Deep in the Tsangpo Gorge, where the expedition cut off from any help or escape, they've demanded $10,000. Scott, is it worth keeping this talking and just trying to find a resolution? Otherwise, this is going to affect the whole expedition right here and now, isn't it? It already has, David. Uh, no, we're, we're already fucked. No, no, we're not fucked. I mean, we're, if we... we're in trouble, but uh, we're not absolutely fucked. Um, right now, we have no options except for to pay them what they want. Basically, I don't think you can ever trust that you've got to deal with porters here. That deal will change with changing circumstances, and anything that they can do to get a further advantage and more money out of it is acceptable practice. What happened today was uh, the first time in my 10 years of coming to the Himalayas where I've been held at hostage and robbed at face by uh, our 43 porters. And unfortunately, uh, it's put a serious strain on the uh, expedition finances and uh, it'll have a huge effect on what we're able to uh, get done from this point on. After three days of what Scott would later describe as hell, assaulted in Shangri-La by the rawest of human emotions. The expedition has hired new porters in Luku and continues on its epic portage to get back to the Tsangpo River. Outside, we'll wire them funds to pay the new porters when they come out of the gorge. It's taken us about eight more days to get here than uh, we'd intended. When we were first up the Sension La, dropping over the um, far side of it to Luku uh, took us on a different route. We had intended to drop down to Hidden Falls with the whole expedition, the kayakers and everyone, and then come down here. Um, with the change of plans, we're now actually breaking off a small expedition to go through to where Hidden Falls and Rainbow Falls are. Ken Storm left with Andrew Shepard, Dustin Lindgren, and David Allardyce to hike a different route over the Sension La Pass around to Rainbow and Hidden Falls. That was sick. They would traverse 23,000 vertical feet before rejoining the expedition a week later. The kayakers, meanwhile, arrive at the Tsangpo, but they discovered a river ravaged by a huge flood that had shredded its riverbanks down to steep bedrock and had destroyed its small footbridges, leaving improvised cable crossings as the only way to get across the river. Yeah. 
Unknown to the outside world, the flood's tidal wave had swept down the Sangpo's tributary, the Po Sangpo, 21 months ago, in a torrent that shook the earth for three days, and which villagers estimated was 300 feet high. It carved sheer cliffs down both sides of the river, all the way through the gorge to the plains of India. We just got done with about nine or 10 days of portaging our boats. Uh, we're looking down at the Po Sangpo. Uh, we'll put on this this afternoon, head down to the confluence, probably sleep there tonight at the confluence, and then wrap around the corner to the apex and, uh, and hopefully uh, take out there before, uh, before things get too ugly. The lower Po Sangpo is another of the world's great stretches of white water never to have been run. On the expedition's 29th day, the kayakers add the lower Po Sangpo to their list of first descents. Kayakers camp that night on the beach at the confluence. Tomorrow, they will take on the combined force of these two pounding rivers and attempt to run the lower Sangpo Gorge. Ken Storm Jr. is one of the great explorers of the Sangpo Gorge. His name will forever be linked with its great waterfalls. In 1997, he was among the first three Westerners ever to see Hidden Falls. This is the most remote and mythic region of the gorge, as Andrew Shepard describes. Well, if you want to put a heart in the gorge, uh, this heart is a pounding right where we're at here. There's two incredible waterfalls in, in a very short distance. And even where it's not a waterfall, it's a very walled in gorge. And it's the epicenter of the gorge and it, it's incredible like the power around you, you you can't help but feel it it almost knocks you over every time you turn around for Sharab, his spiritual journey is complete in 1998 uh, along with ian baker and hamid sardar that we returned to the gorge and actually descended along the route that we've just recently followed and uh, for the first time actually stood along the brink. Even the hunters at that time had said they had not gone this far into the gorge. And uh, it was a thrilling moment, an extraordinary moment, standing above that vortex and, and suddenly realizing, once we put the instruments on the waterfall, that this was indeed the 100-foot waterfall that had been searched for almost 100 years ago. Andrew Shepard rappelled down to where no one had ever set foot before to the edge of the vortex of Hidden Falls. It was pretty exciting. Uh, basically, I was putting my life into a little eight millimeter rope, which felt pretty skinny at that point when I was looking down. It's these little perches that, that are right above these falls that look like such great vantage points that they just draw me in and I have, I have to go stand there and look, you know, get the best view that I can. So I couldn't resist the temptation and uh, being that close to that big of a waterfall was, it gives you energy, you know, you feed from it. Day 30, and the kayakers enter at the confluence, where the river has been totally reworked by the cataclysm. 
their satellite maps of the rapids and riverbank features are no longer of any value. Most of the time what I found was as soon as you got in, you just realized that it was way more difficult to move around than what you anticipated. Uh, there's really strong boils and uh, motions of water coming up from all over the place that send you uh, to places you don't necessarily want to be. So it's a really powerful river. We've managed to navigate this river with confidence and a lot of unknown and have come away unscathed. And I think that any group that looks at this river trip and has looked at this river trip can step back and go, I can't believe that this thing was runnable. And I think that what we've done is a moment in history and this team has just been an incredible group of people. In the annals of adventure, this first ascent of the Sangpo Gorge will be remembered as one of the most accomplished expeditions of our time. After only the first week on the river, the kayakers were boating on waters where no one had ever gone before, through a canyon 18,000 feet deep, and went on to make the first ascent of the Lower Po Sangpo River. They continued down the lower Sangpo Gorge as far as it was humanly possible to proceed. At the apex of the great bend of the Sangpo, the expedition came to an end. Lindgren described their decision as follows. Because of the catastrophic events that have happened within the Sangpo region, there are sections of the river that are unscoutable, unportageable, and river-wide features that make it impassable for the kayaks to descend and continue. What's going on, John? Cable crossing number one. Yeah, 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 yeah. On our way out to Pelong. Pretty dodgy operation. Five days and uh, 12 hours, and um, we've just pulled off the most epic expedition of every single one of these people's entire lives, and uh, we're going home, and it's an incredible feeling. Um, so many things were against us, and uh, it all worked out, and uh, I can't believe it. <laughs>